Three, two. Alright, so this segment will be crime and journalism. Um, what is your opinion on Jack Warner's suggestion that crime stories should not be the front page of newspapers? And it should be placed somewhere in the back or in the middle or not at all? Um, I, I haven't heard the exact quote from Jack Warner. Um, it's coming from an interesting source, I must say. Uh, but I, I think there is some merit to what he's saying, right? There is some merit to what he's saying. The, the only problem, and I understand why, because if you have roughly 500 homicides per year in a country, you could almost argue that it's not news because it's not new. It's not a new occurrence, right? However, I do think that, uh, I mean, a homicide is a, a, a massive, massively, um, it, it's an aberration, you know, to, to be murdered is an aberration. You know, it's a, it's a, it's not the mainstream experience, and that's why it ends up on the, because um, it is an abominable crime. You know, someone's life cannot continue now because of a murder, and that's why it ends up on the front page. Um, but it being on the front page five days out of seven is bad for national morale. It is terrible for national morale, and it does hurt, and it affects the way people see the country. It affects the way people conduct their lives. Um, and I, I mean, I think it should be included in the paper. Absolutely, it should be included in the paper. There's no way it could leave it out in the newspaper. Um, and if it's in the middle of the paper, then people will reach for the middle of the paper faster. You know what I mean? Like, people will seek it out. So the notion that if it's in the paper, people won't read it somehow, people will find it. Um, people will buy a newspaper for the horoscope, read that first. People who buy the newspaper for sports news flip to the back first. You know, people who are looking for a job go to that section first. And, you know, so if it's in the paper, it's gonna we're gonna find out about it. And if he's also saying that it shouldn't be reported in the first ten minutes of a seven o'clock newscast, I think that almost amounts to to a type of suppression. You know, a type of whitewashing. You know, you kind of saying like, look, this is happening, but we don't want you to know about it. Um, I understand his point about how it's, you know, that I can see how it's bad for morale. I can see how it creates the notion that this is a very violent society. Um, it colors our views. But by putting it on the front page too, what he is essentially saying is that you shouldn't live in a country where your life can be snuffed out so easily and lives are snuffed out so frequently. And the media is essentially putting pressure on the government to say, you have to stop this. We don't have the right to carry guns. Citizens don't have the right to carry guns. Criminals are carrying these guns illegally. There are a group of citizens who could carry guns, a, a group of citizens who could carry guns legally, and those people are police officers and the defense force and, and protective services. And why aren't they doing a better job of protecting the citizens? We could protect ourselves, but then we'd have to break the law and get illegal firearms. And really, we have hired the government to protect and create a safe, predictable, stable environment for us to live in and flourish in. And when they're not doing that, that's what the press is essentially doing by saying, look, why aren't you doing your job? And also because of the, this is a terrible human tragedy, a life being lost, you know. And sadly also, and there are many reasons for it, violence sells papers, it, it attracts people's attention. Um, in a morbid way, in a sad way, but it does, and that, which is why in broadcast news, in television news, in radio news, it comes early because um, people are interested in it. People are interested in it, and that's a plain fact as well. Okay, next question. Do you think journalism and crime stories are relatively one-sided in Trinidad and Tobago? And do you see a need for the Marcia Penville type journalism reporting? Um, I think Marcia Henville, by the way, was an outstanding journalist, very brave person, um, did some incredible things in Trinidad, um, left a very good legacy of journalistic work, um, did a different type of journalism, very activist journalist, um, went into the communities, was respected by many stakeholders. Uh, was 
an actual journalist. Um, I, I kind of um, conflicted about Ian Allen. Um, I think actually, I, 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 his style is not a style that I have a tremendous admiration for, but I have to say I, I do respect his ability to find sources. And he has a large following. I think he means well. And I, I, I could be wrong about that, but I think he means well. I think even if he doesn't mean well, he does work that is valuable. He puts the mainstream media under pressure, and that's good. Putting the mainstream media under pressure means that if Ian Hallen has it, we should have it. And we should get it before he does. And he does an extended treatment on it. And his is part journalism, but it's also part um, it's kind of show. You know, it's like it's like uh, neighbor gossiping with you. It's got that quality to it. And which, which is why I think he has a, a following. People see him as a kind of a, a type of friend, you know. But so I like that he puts the mainstream media under pressure to get stories and that he beats them sometimes. Um, so I think there is an appetite for that type of journalism. I think there is an appetite for that type of journalism. I, I, I feel that too much of our journalism is crime journalism is a bit of just this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And I understand the value of that. That, that is how we're traditionally trained to do journalism. The problem, I think, is that there's an absence of real deep analysis of why we have so many homicides in Trinidad. People have sort of like a cursory, superficial understanding of it, but I think we need to have a deeper understanding of why um, in the year 1999 we had 93 homicides and in 2008 we had 550. I mean, that's 10 years. You go, in 10 years you go from 93 homicides to 550 homicides. It's insane. Like I, I mean, it went up sixfold, and it stayed roughly at that level from 2008 to now 2019. So the last 20 years really have just been a murderous society, and it never should really be as murderous as all that. And people know about illegal guns. People know that we're a transshipment point. The other thing about crime reporting is an aspect of crime reporting isn't just reporting crime, an aspect of crime reporting is also reporting are these crimes being solved? And that's something that we don't follow up on. We report the crime, then we move on to reporting another crime and reporting another crime. But cases just go cold and people don't really pick up and say, what's happening with this case? And you know, there was a very um, sort of brave thing that Trinidad Express had done, but mainly because it was a high profile crime victim the CEO of uh, Extra Foods Supermarkets, Vindra and I, Paul Kuhlman, they put up a, a little graphic on the top of their front page saying number of days that she's been missing, a number of days without finding her, you know, but putting pressure on the government and saying, why can't you find her? She's one person. She's been kidnapped from her home in the middle of the night um, and saying, insisting you need a break in this case. It's kind of embarrassing the government and the law enforcement officials into better action and to more aggressive action in solving crime. You know, and that's something in crime journalism that we're not seeing enough of. You know, insisting, saying like this crime is not solved, this other crime is not solved, so many crimes are not solved. And also the follow up, the judiciary gets off light. You know, the judiciary, um, so it's police force, but also the judiciary, people don't, the cases are not followed as closely. Crime journalism should be 360 degrees, it should be everything. But we kind of just doing it at a, at, a, at a superficial level. And at the easiest level, which is just reporting what happened. But we're not doing the deep dive reporting to say where has this gone to and where has this gotten to, you know, and, and has this person's life meant anything and have we extracted justice from this situation? Journalism is supposed to be about producing justice too. And what we're essentially doing is not producing justice, but rather just reporting that a injustice has happened. And that's it. Yeah. Okay, last question here. What is the best advice, in your opinion, you believe you can give an, an aspiring journalist who might be given the mandate to cover crime stories? Um, if you're going to be a good journalist, you need to have a strong contacts book. So you need to make very, you need to network well. Um, you need to build good relationships with police officers. 
uh, good relationships with people in the DPP, Director of Public Prosecutions, you will need um, a certain degree of street savviness. Um, you need to be a brave person, I think. You need to understand the crime problem. You'll need contacts that are non-traditional contacts. And when I say that, I mean you might need contacts of people in a neighborhood, people in a community. Um, I don't like to encourage this, but I, I think people who are criminal journalists, um, who are crime reporters who cover crime, generally can say that they have some contacts in the criminal underworld. Um, so that's something you might need to cultivate as well. So that's networking is very crucial in crime. I think also too, anyone who wants to be a crime journalist has to think about their mental health as well. Has to think about their own personal well-being. I, I know a crime journalist or two who have done it for very many years. Um, when you become a crime journalist and you've done it for a long time, you kind of become a brand, you're almost respected. Um, people say not to touch you because they say, listen, um, he himself has a certain amount of power now. He's a person that we could appeal to, uh, or she, because some of the very, very good crime journalists in this country were women as well. But I do think um, people who work in, in that field need to also think about their personal well being and their personal health and their mental health and have something. I mean, one of my very good friends, Jazzy Gonzalez, who's an excellent crime journalist, um, finds an outlet through working in uh, working in comedy, and, and you know he's one of the voices, the puppets that um, that Santana show, you know, which is very very opposite to what he normally does. And he's a guy who does impressions and that sort of thing. But he says that he needs to have another side of the coin to be able to balance all the sad things that he has to report on you know? and, he, and he says that if she can't protect yourself psychologically you're not going to last in crime journalism you know? and the other thing I would say is that crime journalism is not just murder and blood but it's also white collar crime which is another area of crime that is very underreported and actually not very well understood by the public or even by criminal journalists because it takes a lot of very specific knowledge in accounting and auditing and so forth to understand that type of reporting, um, that type of crime. And again, because it's the harder thing to do, some people don't lean into it because they do the easier thing that everybody could understand. So everyone could understand that there's a dead body on the ground and it's dramatic, but people don't always understand. And, and corruption is a big problem in our country. But people don't understand how corruption happens necessarily and how to catch criminals in the act and because there's the judiciary, but there's also the court of public opinion, you can end someone's career, you can end a criminal, a white collar crime, a white collar criminal's career very quickly in the media by publishing what they do. And that person would be out of a job very quickly, but they could be in a court case for 15 years. But you would, you would put that before the public and the public would trust you and say, if you say, if you investigate it and you found these things, we believe that, and therefore this person cannot continue to have this job or this access to power. You understand? Mm -hmm. So journalists are very powerful in that respect, but they don't use all that power. But again, it takes a certain amount of skill to be a, a, a person who can color white color, cover white collar crime. All right, Carol. Thank you for your time. Great. And I think that was that. Excellent. Thanks uh, for having me. Thanks, yeah.